Looking at London's high streets, it is obvious that this is a city renowned for fashion. People come from all over the world to shop here, and incidentally, so do the clothes themselves. We have all heard the term fast fashion, along with the negative connotations it holds. But what does it all mean? What consequences will it have on us as individuals? And how can we possibly make a change to an industry which mainly operates thousands of kilometers away in Southeast Asia? These are all questions I had been asking myself. I had felt so powerless when it came to tackling issues of the clothing industry that it was only when reading John Thackeray's A Whole New Cloth that I heard about Rebecca Burgess and the first fibre shed in Northern California. I suddenly felt like this was something I could do to create an alternative to make a difference right here in London. A fibre shed is a geographical region where textile cloth is grown, spun and dyed naturally within a specific bioregion. The size of this region is the only requirement for setting one up and so I chose Greater London, roughly within the M25. I had, like Burgess, originally wanted to take a pledge to only wear London grown and made clothing. As I quickly realised this does not exist apart from the one garment made by Zoe Burt in collaboration with Kate Poland and the Cordwainer's Garden at the London College of Fashion. I realised London would first have to grow a wardrobe. I trained in textiles at Central St Martins. I left in 1993 and my first job was working as a printed textile designer for a supplier to the high street. I think partly in reaction to having worked in the fast fashion industry where you're creating designs in a studio, working with a, a team of other people to realise collections and range plan, but it all felt quite a distant process. Having two children now and seeing how much they're both girls, how much they love clothes, I wanted them to sort of really connect with where their clothes come from and, and, and feel that lots of the plants, the clothes that we wear, come from plants like cotton and linen. I'm Kate Poland and I set up Cordwainer's Garden here a few years ago which is in the grounds of the London College of Fashion in Hackney. I've been growing dye plants and also I started growing flax in 2011 so again to try and make that connection between the outdoors and what they're doing inside here. We managed to get some cool schools involved in the, the flax project, as well as sort of other community gardens, but then, and actually doing the process of breaking and, and turning it into thread. But they were really engaged with it, especially, you know, there, there's quite, it's quite tedious a lot of it, but they really like doing the bashing and the, and the um, we taught them the words that, you know, the old words like heckle, scutch, ripple, ret, all these things. I mean, it was quite chaotic, but they, they really, I think what, what was telling was that when we went back with the garment that we then knitted, they remembered all those funny words and they could, you know, they wanted to touch it and smell it. One of the most important ones is Mada and Woad, which are, which are specialised plants that aren't, but most things we have here are just ordinary garden plants that you can use for dyeing. So the woad is the magic blue. Um, yeah, I mean most plants you can get some colour out of uh, some colour. It's usually yellow or variations, but it's also yellow is very is fugitive too, so it doesn't last long. Whereas woad, uh, which is the same, has the same um, constituents as indigo, um, will last. And the same with the the madder, it will last for more than hundreds of years. It's probably the first time it's been done like this since the Industrial Revolution, I would guess. 
So this is an example of flax that has been processed at the Cotswolds at Flaxland. And you can see here really clearly how it looks exactly like hair. And also to highlight as well, the top that I'm wearing is a jersey linen and this skirt is also linen. So linen comes in lots of different guises. It truly is an amazing plant. And also because these are all old heritage skills that we're having to relearn completely from scratch. And it, it taught us so many things about um, you know, watching the flax grow, it takes 90 days for the plant to grow. Uh, it has these lovely blue flowers. Um, and after the flowers have gone and the seed balls start forming, then you can pull it up, it's ready for harvest. You have to pull it up by the whole roots so you get the whole length of the plant. And then you have to leave it to ret out in the dew and the rain to break down the outer roots of the plant. And then after that, you have to break the outer fibre as well to get these strands that are inside which can then be spun and formed into thread to make the fabric. This one here is actually just with onion skins. You can get many tones from onion skins, so I just save all my onions when I'm doing the cooking. This is also from the same dye bath but nearer the beginning. This is on a silk georgette using shibori techniques of resist to get the patterning. Um, this one and this one are both apple bough. So this is the bark of apple which I've whittled away and then soaked for um, a couple of weeks and then boiled up to get these very subtle colours. So these are a selection of colours. This is a working palette made from natural dyes using fruits and berries. So this one here is made from avocado pips. It's a really soft, pinky tan color. Then there's Mahonia berries here, which you see growing around in lots of gardens. Um, and the berries there create a lovely bluish gray color, which when modified with iron also turn it a greeny gray color. There's fresh blackberries. You get this delicious pale purple color. Um, and then using fruit teas as well, raspberry teas and blackcurrant teas to get a whole range of colours. What you notice with the natural colours is how harmoniously they all sit together as well. The fibre comes from a plant and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of sort of dedication to, to extract that and uh, to turn, something, turn it into something. So I mean there will be, there is a group of children here who understand the sort of labour involved in making clothing. So hopefully some of them will <laughs> some of them will take care of their clothes more and not just rush off to Primark. The London Linen Garment was a hugely successful project in educational terms, but my interest lies in whether it would be scalable. Would it be economically viable to grow many garments to build a collection of seasonal clothing grown in London. When a 16 to 35 year old goes for her shopping hit, she is just responding on an emotional level to the garment that she sees without any cognitive or intellectualizing um, um, process really taking place in that point of sale. Um, ha having no concept of fiber, yarn, weave, knit, uh, the origins of any kind of thread um, it's, it's been a successful sort of two-year project really in getting kids in the end to uh, spin their own linen having grown local uh, flax crops around London within the M25. What would be fantastic about the fibre shed is it builds upon that foundation and has the potential of creating fashion collections. Um, the idea of regionality um, within different parts of London. So you've got the Brixton collection, you've got the Shoreditch collection, you've got the Wembley collection. There's, there's so much potential in terms of crops, colours, um, different mix um, within the earth for your different um, sort of vintages, if you like, of colours and crops within London and maybe Greater London, uh, linking up with um, 
makers and producers on mainland Europe. Um, immense um, wealth of possibility and money-making opportunities. Then we've got potential to really commercialise sustainable textile business, practice, manufacture, cons consumption, post post-life of one garment, extended life scenarios, all sorts of recycled fibre closed loop scenarios. And who else is doing that? Also, it is about reinforcing the sense of community and moving away from an individualistic drive, especially when it comes to consumption. As designers, it is also important to collaborate and work together. This is something the Slow Textiles Group has facilitated. After all, even though Zoe succeeded, it took her over a year to make a garment. No one can make a garment themselves from seed to finish if it is to feed any kind of demand that is more than simply educational. Therefore, we need to enlist the skills of all kinds of people if the fibre shed is to succeed. It would be lovely to see this project go forward and become, as well as educational, um, economically viable as well, and help people reconnect with the where their clothes come from, and you know, help create a, a UK fashion grown industry as well. And that also showed you can do much more by enlisting and collaborating with other people than you can on your own. I think it's a, a natural growing trend to want to know about the provenance of things. You've seen it happened in the food industry very much, uh, slow food movement, and I think that it's been happening in fashion and textiles, maybe with quite a small group, but uh, it'd be lovely to create a, a kind of bigger consciousness and awareness of that throughout the country and help people get back in touch with where their clothes come from and care about where they're made, care about the pe who the people the people who made them, that they are getting a, a fair wage and a fair deal, they're not being affected by the pesticides or insecticides that are grown. And we live in this life where it's, we all know it's not just about money, it's about social currency, community currency, educational currency, there's so many different forms of energy. Money is currency, it is an energy, but there are many other aspects as well. It comes down to a question of value. Why has Primark been so successful? In a time of recession, cheaper commodities make it seem like this could be a sign of our achievement, the fact that clothing is so affordable. But, as we have seen with the recent documentary, The True Cost, somebody else is paying the cost. Somebody, probably in Bangladesh or Cambodia, is suffering as the prices get forced down, and so is the environment. So is it really cheaper, or have our values changed as the distance to the making has grown? I guess it might not hit, you know, the mass market, but I think the idea could. And, you know, if the idea can, and, and maybe if some of the mass producers can identify with the project in some way, um, then maybe that might help them think about how they engage with their factories overseas to, to do things better or to use fewer chemicals. But I think that's a really interesting idea, thinking about what motivates people to buy more ethically and more locally and what, where the clothing sits within that. I suppose my motivations for buying food is the environment, health and supporting the local economy. <clears throat> so I suppose that'd be kind of similar things with uh, a local fibre shed and also knowing, knowing that you're supporting local people as well. One of the things that can be quite off-putting with any kind of sustainability argument is the scaremongering. So um, in general it seems to be presumed that in order to mobilise people and get them to do things differently you have to put things in the worst possible terms and I think that all that does is really polarise the debate and make it actually less likely to bring in perhaps marginal people whereas if it's more of a a positive outlook, just stating the great benefits of doing things in a sustainable way, whether it's how you source your fibres or where the clothes are made or um, something in line with kind of fair trade terms for fabrication and workmanship. I think that could be really beneficial. In the press it's all about 
uh, food. It's about the impact of food and there's a lot of debates going and also how well farmers are paid for milk and so forth. But there's not much in the press about the textile industry. I do know, I did read an article once about uh, saying that King Cotton had um, wiped out the hemp industry, um, whereas hemp is you know, easier to grow, more environmentally friendly, but because of association with cannabis, it's obviously restricted. Um, so certainly if I saw some clothing in a shop made of hemp over cotton, I'd definitely go for that. Cotton is um, very heavy, can be very heavy on water use and pesticide use as well. And it is a commodity that's bought and sold on the stock market as well, which you don't have for flax or other commodities. Um, and I find that really interesting as well, how that has affected, how that has become the predominant crop for textiles and fashion in our world. And it does seem, again, out of balance. I think there's m much more room for other, other plants, such as flax and hemp, to come back and be of more use to everybody. I believe that we have to readjust our values. I'm not saying that a London fibre shed wardrobe would replace current systems of commerce within fashion, but with each piece bought would come a story, a connection to a sheep, a farmer, a maker, and hopefully this could help to realign the values we have assigned to clothing. It's about thinking in different currencies, not just in terms of money. Having a group enables new collaborations and new um, conversations to, to take place. I think the Fibre Shed is another example of group-based work, um, including lots of different uh, producers, suppliers, uh, manufacturers, growers, visionaries, um, and, pl and a platform and a visibility. So again, it's it's this idea of just groups rippling out and supporting each other and creating new enterprise, new ideas, new hybrids, new versions of what textiles is. Both my passion and background are in woven textiles. I have never had a studio or worked on a proper loom since leaving Goldsmiths. We visited Bonnie the Weaver to see how her business works. To my surprise, she does not make small batches of cloth as I envisioned. Instead, she designs and weaves samples, which she then sells to fashion and interior houses at trade fairs, complete with the rights to the design and how to construct it. I love the process, the fact that you can create a fabric from scratch. Um, so you're choosing your warp yarns, your weft yarns, your pattern, your colour, um, the end quality, the end weight. Um, for example, with print, you have to start off with a base cloth and then you're um, changing the surface. Um, but for weave, you can just choose um, the cloth right from the beginning. So that's mainly for the fashion market, so hand-woven fabric samples which I sell at trade shows and at appointments. I consult and design their collections um, and they're selling those collections to the UK, um, Europe and the States. And um, so that's um, designing the whole collection, looking at all the trends, new colours, um, and then providing them with the designs and the CAD files for them then to um, produce in their mills. I haven't been asked whether it's been naturally dyed but if I have to provide the technical um, specification with a sample that I've sold then I can detail down where I bought the yarns. Quite often they don't actually ask what the fabric's made from. Um, it could be just the look and the, the feel. When they're walking past the stand at um, Premier Vision it's, it goes on the, the look of the fabric rather than what it's made from or the handle of it mm -hmm. and then that will come second. I'm always interested in working in collaborative um, on various different projects, um, whether I can help with the, the dyeing of the yarns or 
sampling new patterns and new techniques on the looms I have at the moment um, and then maybe working with someone on the technical side to get the, the fabric woven. For example, when I was um, hand weaving the scarves, they take so long to firstly set up the loom and then hand weave them. I'll, if I was to retail them, um, they would be over sort of 700, 800 pounds. So I made the decision that that wasn't viable. I don't think necessarily that a lot of the customers understand how labour intensive or technical it is. It's more about the appearance of the fabric and uh, the performance of it. Mm -hmm. Most clothes seem to be not made in England, so if you check it's just the same message again and again. But it's always a pleasant surprise when you find something that is actually made even in Europe. The issue is quite often that I'm that I feel so detached from the companies that I'm that I feel like I don't know much about it anyway, so why should I care? But for example, if you tell me, oh, I made this piece, I would be actually really interested in buying it because I know that you made it and you can tell me. It's more like the story about the piece, I think, is really important to me. I'm very particular, actually, about what things are made of. Um, I do tend to avoid synthetics as, as much as possible. Things that are important to me is that things are going to last. I don't like throwaway fashion. If I find something that I like, I want to keep it. I don't want it to wear out. I just find it's, it's much more agreeable wearing natural materials. Um, they tend not to get smelly, they tend to last better. Um, on the whole, they're much nicer to wear. I think in terms of the um, shift between, in attitudes, maybe between my age group and younger people, they're possibly because some clothes are so incredibly cheap that uh, young people just think that I can wear it once and I don't, I can throw it away and I don't need to think about where this has come from, how it's been produced, which I per personally feel quite strongly about. I don't know, Sarah or Primark, it's, I always feel like it's, it comes from the same factory and I don't really trust them, trust them. So if someone tells me that is really from a good place, it's made in the UK or in Germany, I don't know, um, and I can really trust them, then I think I would spend a bit more on, on the clothes. Yeah. The good thing about working with somebody locally, of course, is that you can get something that's made just for you, especially if they're a small-scale fabricator and they can work that into their timescales. I think if this draws attention to exactly what goes into making things and, you know, all the, the different um, techniques, um, then I think it should be really helpful and help educate people as well. Uh, and make them feel more connected to what they're wearing. These are all stories we should reconnect with. Textile and garment making are so much of what makes us human. Their collaborative nature unites us in a need to keep warm, to shield us from the elements, and to provide a second skin, not only historically, but as a form of identity. So many people are passionate about what they wear. It is time to wander again at the processes behind the cloth and to appreciate the people who currently have no choice but to hide behind the label.